year 12 and welcome to my first attempt at a Loom lesson. Um, as you know, over the past few weeks, we've been focusing on different aspects of crime, uh, whether that be the detective or the criminal or the rise of the police force. And this week, we're going to be focusing on the courtroom. All of these aspects are to prepare you for the unseen extract on paper two, section A. So the aim of this week's sessions um, is to focus on and understand the legal system um, represented in fiction and that they use specific vocabulary um, to create that sense of reality in their fiction. We're also going to think about why writers might use a courtroom scene in their novels and finally to look at an extract from Pickwick Papers by Charles Dickens and an extract from To Kill a Mockingbird by Harper Lee um, and look at their fictitious courtroom scenes and look at techniques that are employed, employed by both of those authors to create a sense of reality um, and atmosphere. So today's lesson, um, we're going to be focusing mainly on Pickwick Papers, um, but I've just got this quotation to share with you. Um, not sure where it's from, but it, it's kind of a, an ironic statement, but it fits in with the idea of the drama of a courtroom. So it says here that a courtroom is no place to seek justice, redemption or any satisfactory closure, which, of course, heightens the, the, the drama of any courtroom scene. So I'm going to ask you to pause the video in a second because I want you to have a look at this language as legalese. So vocabulary which is associated with the legal profession. So there are six different words here. I'd like you to Google or use dictionary and find the definitions of them and write those down. And I'd also like you to think of whether you know any other legal terms. So pause the video now and complete that exercise. So what is a courtroom drama? Well, it's a, a, an, the ideal subject area for crime fiction. It's full of suspense. You've got trials. You might have lawyers who are battling with each other. You might have um, this one on one conflict between a prosecutor and a defendant, which heightens the drama. Um, sometimes you've got the big guy against the little guy. You've got um, uh, you know, the more fundamental idea of good versus evil. And often um, courtroom dramas, especially fictional ones, are um, focused on the issues of race, sex, cash, capital punishment and so on. I've attached to your email an article entitled 10 mistakes made by authors when writing crime scenes. What I'd like you to do is I'd like you to read through the article and then think about why authors might make these mistakes. Now, please note that mistakes is in inverted commas because are they really mistakes or are they adopting and creating a fictionalised account? And so they have to, they're forced to make these mistakes. Please read through the article now. Pause the video, come back. So you should have read all of those ideas now, these 10 mistakes that writers make. So I've chosen one to focus in on. This idea that um, in fictionalised um, representations of the courtroom, lawyers move around the courtroom. So we often see this in, in courtroom dramas, in films, because they add to the visual experience. It would be very dull to sit and watch um, a very still scene, which would be very realistic. If you've ever watched a real life courtroom scene, um, you know, there's quite a lot around at the moment, uh, making a murder and so on. Um, they're very still and not necessarily as dramatic as they might be in a text or in a film or a TV programme. So this mistake, is it really a mistake is what we need to think? Or is the writer adopting different techniques in order to create movement, to create drama within a text? So I'd like to watch this clip here, which um, exemplifies the, the idea of, of a dramatic courtroom scene taken from um, a 
the uh, film A Few Good Men. So have a watch. So the big question is, why do writers include courtroom scenes in their novels? Well, they offer great plot devices, okay? There's this idea of everything hanging on a courtroom decision. The, the protagonist must win. They've got to save the day. They've got to succeed before the trial can end. And, and that heightens the, the, the drama. Courtrooms are also a great place to find these kind of characterizations. So you might have a very detailed description of a judge and their characteristics and their foibles. You might have a very strong um, lawyer or a fidgeting juror. And it's, it's the perfect environment for a writer to really characterize those people that are in that courtroom. The reader can also go through this intense range of emotions with the characters and you know that can depend but that can all depend on the differing points of view for example who is telling this story whose viewpoint are we hearing this from are we being given um the the point of view of the victim are we being given the point of view of the spectators in the gallery what, what is it whose whose eyes are we watching this through and then we've got the human aspect We've all seen examples of, of crime courtroom drama, so we can easily relate to what is happening. So here's an ex excerpt from uh, Pickwick Papers by Charles Dickens. I'd like you to read through the extract and I'd like you to make some notes on each of the, um, the yellow box and the blue box first of all. And I'm going to talk through the yellow box and the blue box next. Wait, please, for the red box that will come after. OK, so you may have found in the yellow box some of this um, that I've, I've, I've kind of highlighted in red. So I've got we've got the basic court. Then we've got the spectators in the gallery. We've got the gentlemen in wigs. We've got the barristers, the Bar of England. We've got the briefs. We've got the octavos. All of this, which positions this um, extract in a courtroom. This language, this legalese, um, and the language places the extract within a courtroom. But then we've also got this sense of theatricality in the extract that Dickens has created. So I've highlighted in yellow, um, we've got this pretty large sprinkling of spectators in the gallery and a numerous muster of gentlemen in wigs in the barrister's seats who presented as a body all that pleasing and extensive variety of nose and whisker for which the Bar of England is so justly celebrated. And so you, you've almost got this um, caricature of a courtroom and these quite pompous gentlemen, the, the pomp and ceremony of a courtroom in the 19th century. You've got the um, this idea here of impressing the fact more strongly ob on the observation of the, of the spectators. So you've got this um, real awareness that the people in the courtroom, the, the, the judges and the lawyers, that there are people watching them. And so they looked as wise as they conveniently could. Others, again, moved here and there with great restlessness and earnestness of manner. So they're very serious, content to awaken there by the admiration and astonishment of the uninitiated strangers. There's almost an element of mocking here from Dickens, where he says it, it looked as wise as they conveniently could. Um, you know, they, they're almost playing a role of what they, the spectators expect them to be. We've got this seriousness, this earnestness of manner um, and this where they want to awaken the admiration and astonishment of these people who don't know much about a courtroom. And it's all, there's almost a slight mocking tone here from, from Dickens, which leads us into this red question. What is the tone of the piece? Is there an air of um, movement, of restlessness, of stillness? Is Dickens mocking what is happening here? Is there a sense of importance? So I want you to decide what is Dickens' 
what tone is Dickens trying to create in this piece? What is his viewpoint about the legal system? And I'd like you to write a paragraph using quotations from the extract to answer your questions to the above. So if you can complete that, and I would like that in by Friday at four, please. Okay, so moving on, this is the second lesson. You might choose to do this on Thursday as well, but this is the second lesson for Friday. We're going to be focusing on um, Harper Lee's To Kill a Mockingbird. And if you've never seen it or you've never um, read the text, it, I would highly recommend it if you've got the time to watch or read it. The film is astonishing, but the book is even more superb. It's one of the most famous and important courtroom scenes in literature. Um, so I want you to watch a clip and I'd like you to also then read the extract that's taken from chapter 25, which is attached to the email that I sent out to you. OK, so I've attached some focus questions for the extract to the email as well. And I want you to read through those focus questions and make some notes and start to select some language focus. So the question that you're gonna be focusing on is how does Lee use language to create atmosphere in the courtroom scene of To Kill a Mockingbird? So we're really focusing on how Harper Lee has used um, language to create whatever kind of atmosphere you decide to focus on. I've decided in my model to focus on the time OK, the idea of this um, courtroom awaiting a verdict. OK, so let me just read through my model. Throughout the extract, the reader is given a sense of a courtroom awaiting a verdict. Scout herself states, ain't it a long time? But the reader does need to be aware that Scout is an eight year old child and a short wait might seem longer in a child's eyes over an adult's. So Scout is eight years old, and for an eight-year-old, five minutes seems the same as five hours. So this could be um, actually quite a short amount of time, but the way that the language is used further on in the account moves, moves it into this idea of time going very, very slowly. Scout herself is fighting sleep, which adds to this idea that she's a small child, whilst her cousin Dale was sound asleep. This adds to the sense that the spectators have been waiting a long time for the verdict. The onomatopoeic verb bonged not only indicates a childish description of a clock chiming, but creates a sense of time. The impression of a clock chiming 11 times gives the reader the sense of a long, drawn out wait. So compare that to a clock chiming once or twice, chiming 11 times draws out and adds to the atmosphere of this waiting. So as I put up here, remember that we're focusing on the language that is used. So your task is going to be to use my model on the previous slide to produce your own analysis of the language used to create the atmosphere in the courtroom. That could be the stillness of the courtroom. That could be the tension in the courtroom. You might choose to focus on one of the characters and how the language is used to create atmosphere through one of the characters. Because it's a real focus on the language, I don't want you writing a whole essay. I just want you to write one side of A4, so two to three paragraphs, one side of A4, focusing on the language that is used on an aspect of the atmosphere that you can pick out. And I'd like you to um, submit that again by Friday at 4 p.m. so I can take a look at that and feed that back to you. Now my final slide is some suggested reading. If this has kind of piqued your interest, if you like the idea of courtroom drama, um, and I know that's a particular area that fascinates me, there's a whole list of uh, 10 here. Um, to Kill a Mockingbird is on there. Um, and there are a couple of John Grisham novels. If you've never read John Grisham, again, I'd highly recommend. Um, I believe he was a lawyer and a lot of his texts focus on um, the courtroom process. Um, and the, again, there's Agatha Christie on there, but you might want to widen your repertoire a little bit if you've already read a bit of Christie. 
Um, but this is some suggestive reading and this all gives you a real good grounding for the unseen extract question on paper two. Um, and I'll leave it there. So um, the final thing I just want to say is if you can hear screaming or fighting children in the background, I apologise. Um, There's not much I can do about it, to be honest. Um, I hope you enjoy this. I know that some of the feedback I'm getting is that you're enjoying the um, the crime aspect of the of the course. So keep doing what you're doing. You're doing a brilliant job. Any issues, just drop me an email.